Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our exploration of the art of the 18th and early 19th century. That would be looking at Rococo, Neoclassicism, and Romanticism in Europe and somewhat in the United States. All of these three art styles are somewhat interrelated, but they also have their distinctions, which we shall see. This image by Angelica Kaufman is an example of the neoclassical style, um, almost an epitome of it, because what is this artist doing? Well, she's a woman, so that's radical, and she's drawing a classical Greek sculpture, which really epitomizes a lot of the, some of the themes and the ideal behind that style. The 18th century, or 1700s, was a time of upheaval throughout Europe. There were major changes occurring in many realms, social, political, technological, and economic. At the beginning of the century, right around the year 1700, Louis XIV, who had named himself the Sun King, still ruled over France. He presided over his realm and really over French culture from the grandiose palace of Versailles. And he demanded that all of the courtiers and nobility live nearby so he could keep an eye on them. This palace and the excesses that were associated with it inspired architecture and excesses across Europe. By 1800, however, all of this had changed. There was a philosophy known as the Enlightenment. And this helped to lay the foundation for the destabilization of the monarchy in Europe and also inspired Thomas Jefferson in writing the Declaration of Independence in America. In addition, there was the Industrial Revolution, which radically changed the way that the people of Europe lived and made their livelihoods. While the overall um, effect of the Industrial Revolution was quite positive, there were also some negative uh, influences that came from that, and we'll look at those as well. The two examples on this page reflect the Rococo style, which is an idealization of, you could say, the good life, which we'll see on the left by Francois Bouchoy. And on the right, we have an example that could also be attributed to neoclassical style by Johann Winkelmann. Let's take a look at Rococo. Rococo sounds like the word uh, Rococo. Uh, when Louis XIV died in 1715, the aristocratic culture of France changed radically. After he had insisted that the high level of nobility live nearby at Versailles, uh, they all scattered throughout France and really across Europe after his death. The elite palace crowd took the opportunity to leave Versailles and expand their power. They decorated their new villas in towns all across France in a new style that came to be called Rococo. The Rococo style has lots of frills and elegance. It could be attributed to what one might call conspicuous consumption. The word itself, Rococo, refers to the shells and pebble motifs that were part of the style. Now just take a look at this sitting room here, which looks both grandiose and quite frankly, a little bit uncomfortable. Like you wouldn't really want to sit down, but it sure lets you know that the people there are uh, rather wealthy. It's the, from the Salon des Princesses. Here's another example of Rococo style, which really says it all. And this one is from Munich, Germany, but it's from the Nymphenburg Palace. Um, I don't think I need to say anything about this except, wow. How about all that gilding and decoration? So what was Rococo painting like? Well, generally it celebrated the excesses and the frivolous nature of the aristocratic class. And this was in the century before the French Revolution. You could say things just kind of got out of hand in terms of uh, lavish spending and a very sharp distinction between the upper and lower classes. Two of the prominent Rococo painters were Antoine Watteau and his student, Jean Fragonard. Watteau created a style called Fete Galante, and this depicted the lavish outdoor entertainments enjoyed by French high society. In other words, he painted a lot of parties in gardens. 
Most of his paintings um, are a little bit more zoomed out than this one, but that would make them hard to see in the slide. So here we have some people talking to the musician and just having a jolly old time. Now Fragonard, this is one of his most famous uh, paintings. I read at one point that it was created for one of the mistresses of Louis the Fifteenth, and she did not really want it. So um, that's why it survived the French Revolution, although I have read other stories as well. So let's just take a look at what's going on here. This young, dainty lady has gotten someone to push her. Maybe it's a bishop or a kindly old gentleman, while her uh, beloved or secret tryst is hiding in the bushes and um, <clears throat> getting quite a view. So this would have been a large-scale painting and slightly, you could say, slightly naughty at the time. But beyond that, it really exemplifies this idea of like, ho, ho, all is gay, while the French Revolution was brewing in the background. On the other hand, we have the Enlightenment. And this philosophy, it's really a, a lifestyle and a philosophy which affected art and, as we said earlier, affected even the Declaration of Independence. The Enlightenment emerged in the 18th century really as a reaction to the excesses of the Rococo era. The Enlightenment philosophy was based on a belief that there were natural laws or universal principles that were accessed by rational thought and that this was key to having a successful state and really living a successful life. We can trace these beliefs back to uh, Plato from the Greek, philo uh, Greek philosopher. Personally, I'm a little sketchy to think that my view is that to put all of our stock in purely rational thought might limit the human condition. But having said that, this inspired the Declaration of Independence and was uh, um, very important to Thomas Jefferson, so there was something there, eh? As in the Renaissance, the root of the Enlightenment philosophy was a focus on this classical thinking of ancient Greece. Enlightenment artists focused on simple compositions rather than the rather frivolous ones that we see in Rococo. The motto of the Enlightenment was ade sapere, or dare to think. The Enlightenment philosophers criticized both the church and the state as they believed that these institutions put irrational limits on intellectual thought. The idea behind this was that if we could just live by rational thought alone, then the problems of society would disappear. Personally, I think it's not quite that simple, but um, it seemed to inspire a lot of people. One of those people was the artist Jacques-Louis David. Here we have the death of Socrates. So it's that moment when Socrates is being given the glass of hemlock and he's going to poison himself to uh, serve the higher good. So at the same time as we have the Enlightenment, we have the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution radically changed people's relationships with goods and services. Mass production and factories replaced artisans and small workshops, really throughout Europe. This made items of daily life much more accessible, but it also resulted in a new class of factory workers who often worked long hours in difficult conditions for minimal pay. The idealization of the progress of the period is exemplified by this picture. And this one is by Joseph Wright of Derby. He's uh, an English painter, and it's called Experiment on a Bird. Now, in perfect Enlightenment fashion, um, it's all about the science. And me, I think, what about the poor little bird? <laughs> but really, it's, an, it's a celebration of the great advances in science, which were going to continue through the 18th and 19th century and on into the 20th century, where we'll look at that at a later time. Look at the light here. And think about the artist Caravaggio that we saw in the Baroque era. And notice how um, the reflection of the light really brings our attention to the center. However, this figure, who is the scientist, is maybe our focal point, maybe where we finally land. 
Now, in addition to science, we have great developments in engineering. This is the first cast iron bridge. It was made in the mid-1760s. It's actually really quite beautiful of design when you see the circles and um, there's a way that it reflects in the water and creates a full circle that's really quite beautiful. This is uh, from a location in England uh, called the Colebrookdale Bridge, first cast iron bridge. So another thing that we see is these sort of moralistic paintings coming out of the Enlightenment era. The artist that painted this one was the leading painter of this time period in art. His name is Jean-Baptiste Chardin, and he was really um, kind of the poet, the artistic poet of the era. What he's done here is he's idealized this simple act of laying a table and saying grace as apparently the mother and older daughter are teaching the younger girl how to say grace. Um, this artist was much admired throughout Europe and even Louis XV, who was the uh, ruler of France who really led to the French Revolution, he owned this painting for a time. So in addition to honoring women in their domestic roles, women were also honored as painters. Here are two of the main painters of the era. We have Adelaide Labie Gerard, and she was the first woman to be welcomed into the French Academy, which was quite a deal for the time. Both of these women were um, quite adequate painters, very you know, skilled painters in their own right. Let's look at the painting on the left. Not only is this a self-portrait, this artist is showing that she's teaching the next generation of women to be artists. Another very well-known female painter was Angelica Kaufman. We saw her in the opening slide, and here is another of her works. And this is a painting based on mythology, but the point is that um, the woman on the right is showing her jewels and asking Cornelia, let me see your beautiful jewels. And what Cornelia is saying is, oh, my jewels are my children. So this is classic enlightenment philosophy exemplified in a painting. Domesticity, home life, a return to simplicity, that uh, the wealth lies in family and in living a good life, as opposed to collecting wealth and jewels. Now, this one, this artist happens to be a favorite of mine, William Hogarth. And it's difficult to see all that's going on here. Um, this is called the actors or, or something like that. It's the theater, you know, the backstage at the theater. I will tell you that I actually worked on one of these original prints uh, as an art conservator and went over it bit by bit. So was delighted to see this uh, as a reference that I could present to all of you. It's difficult to see, and I encourage you, if you can, to stop the presentation and really look closely at everything that's going on here because it's just crazy. Like here we have a little child in a bird suit that's getting into some kind of mischief. Um, there's a drunken person somewhere. There's the clothes are hanging out to dry. There's some monkeys. I mean, it's really hilarious. So what William Hogarth did was he made fun of and was sort of like a cartoonist, really, of the era. He also did paintings, um, which are similar in style and in theme. Another artist that's an interesting one to take a look at is Thomas Gainsborough. These are his two daughters. Now, Gainsborough did a lot of portraits, um, but I find his daughters fascinating because they were both the subjects of many of his works. And um, one of them died young, and the other one ended up in an insane asylum. So I always look at these two young women, and I think, what is your story? It could have been just the pressure of growing up in the era, but they are um, presented here as two tender, young, and beautiful women. And look at how the one of them, she's holding the portfolio and a pencil which says that maybe she will be an artist herself. So this brings part one of the Rococo, Neoclassicism, and Romantic Era 
uh, audio lecture to a close. Hey, thanks for listening. Come back for part two.